welcome to another episode of the Coach and Ben Wake podcast. I am your co-host, Dr. Ben Wake. Before I introduce my co-host, I just want to say yet again, please like, sh- <laughs> like, share, and subscribe. It's not YouTube, you just sh- but share and uh, and you can subscribe and do all that kind of stuff. We want an audience. We want you to tell your friends. Your friends are welcome to this party. And this is a kind of a fun party. Uh, Coach, what's happening at this party? Well, today we're going to be talking about Woody Allen, and we're going to devote the whole podcast to the pictures of Woody Allen, and we're going to inevitably have to discuss a little bit about the private life of Woody Allen, considering some recent events that have happened. Uh, so we, we want to talk about Woody Allen because, look, before we get into it, we have to acknowledge the fact that he is indisputably one of the great film directors uh, in cinema history. Uh, to, to pretend otherwise, to say differently, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Woody Allen has had more um, uh, uh, original screenplay nominations for the Academy Award than any other writer ever. In point of fact, he's won three uh, for best screenplay. It was uh, for Annie Hall, for um, uh, the... the, the, um, Hannah and Her Sisters. Hannah and Her Sisters and Midnight in Paris, and also one for best director for Annie Hall. Four Oscars, and like I said, more nominations for, for screenplay than any other writer. And he wrote them all by himself, or only a couple of times with... Uh, Marshall with Brickman a few Marshall times, Marshall yeah. Brickman, yeah. Just a couple of times. One of them was Annie Hall, famously. So, look, the guy is a giant in cinema. He created the Woody Allen movie, okay, because it really is stylistically uh, his kind of picture. Long takes, relatively few cuts. Uh, the camera, more often than not, positioned almost like he is... Uh, the camera is a guest at a cocktail party swiveling around to see what's going on as opposed to moving. There are relatively few camera moves in, in his scenes. Uh, and on the exteriors, there are lots of tracking shots and all the rest of it. But in, in terms of interiors, he just tends to pan. He doesn't really move the camera, which is really interesting. We'll get into that. But the, the point is, he really has a style. He really has an approach Francis Coppola famously is envious of his career because he said that Woody Allen is the only guy who has done the films that he wanted to do and, and nobody hassled him. He never had to go begging for money. He never had to um, compromise his work. He's always r- filmed the scripts that he wanted to film and he didn't have to change them for anybody and he got the cast that he wanted. He's a fucking giant. And... Um, Diane Keaton, to finish off this intro, Diane Keaton once said that um, Woody Allen was the the man with the biggest balls she'd ever met. And that's true. You know, Nebishi and all that, he got his way every fucking time. It, that's not luck. Not if after you're doing it for 50 fucking years. That's because you're some kind of fucking genius. And he is. He had a great line. It's like, act like an artist and they'll treat you like one. And and I, he yep. absolutely you know pulled that off. And you know what's interesting? I've always known Woody Allen. It, it, it's funny, you know, he's... The good comparison point to me is like, you know, Clint Eastwood in that he's someone who is simultaneously an exceptional director and yet icon- an iconic actor as well. Like for Woody Allen is so iconic that if you put him in silhouette and just showed those glasses, you'd know who he yeah. is. It's, that's Woody Instantly. Allen. That's Instantly. How, that's how, how, you know, well put together and constructed that persona is. And, and I know, I mean, I've been aware of Woody Allen you know, since a little kid, but you know, when I really got into him was like around the time that I was uh, exiting high school, going into college, and yeah. around that time, you, it's like you you can notice and appreciate the wit of someone. And by that, I don't just mean the co- the comedy, although that's clearly a piece of it, but just the way that someone goes about you know doing their thing, telling their story. It's like I, you know, this is my goal. I'm going to achieve it. And wow, that look how smoothly that guy kind of pulled it in. Yeah. And it, you know, there's no, in, in, and again, Clint Eastwood uh, seems like a great comparison because they both are like, you know, I'm going to do exactly what I need to do in the, in the minimum way kind of possible. And you're still going to be very impressed. Yeah, exactly. So to go back a little bit to his career, because we both Ben Wayne and I really want to talk about his film career and the meat of it and go into discussion of it. He started off at 16 as a joke writer for Sid Caesar, was it? Yeah, he was he was one of the and my, that round table of writers mm. is a fantastic crowd of people to be around and Woody to be impressive and he was like the youngest little kid compared yeah. to everybody else. Yeah, he was the youngest kid there at Sid Caesar's table. It, 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 the guy who created Mash was there. Who else? I mean, there were like Neil several. Simon. Neil Simon. Um, uh, I'm I'm now gonna I gotta look it up because this is yeah. you know impressive. Yeah, it, it was an impressive uh, group, and from there he evolved into a screenwriter, 
and uh, eventually he directed his first picture in 66. It was What's Up Tiger Lily. Go to the IMDb page if you're listening to this. Uh, that way there's a list of all his pictures. We're looking at the list of the pictures that he directed, okay, not the ones that he wrote, because he wrote several. Uh, and he acted in a whole bunch that he did not either write or direct, uh, like, for instance, The Front uh, or right. Scenes from a Mall. Um, those are the two pictures that I can recall offhand that he neither wrote or directed, but he acted in as he basically played Woody Allen, you know, the nebbishy guy. Um, and here's the thing. He started out with uh, What's Up, Tiger Lily, which um, – then, then he did Take the Money and Run, Bananas, uh, you know, Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. This was in early 72. But the first true Woody Allen picture is generally acknowledged to be, and I would agree with this, is um, Annie Hall. Because before Annie Hall, he was doing funny pictures, comedies. Like he did uh, a Sleeper, which was about some, it was about the future, and he was, somebody had slept. He's the ri- it's basically Rip Van Winkle. Yeah. He, you know, he falls asleep, he wakes up into a sort of totalitarian space, and yet he's, you know, it's making fun of Japanese flying packs and Marlon Brando on the waterfront and all kinds yeah. of shit. Yeah. And Love and Death was basically a parody of uh, uh, Ingmar Bergman pictures with, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Diane Keaton. Now, it's, yeah, and, it's, and, a, and a peon, you know, and a pastiche of all of the great Russian literature kind of smooshed into one. I actually haven't seen them. You know, I, I have not seen his pre Annie Hall pictures. I just haven't gotten around to it uh, because Annie Hall is a terrific picture. And, and but go ahead, you want to talk about the early pictures first? The well, early funny I'll just, ones. I'll just, oh, yeah, the early funny ones. So that's a reference to for those who are in in the know. Uh, one of his later movies. It's very self aware. Stardust memories. You know, it, you know, it's like it, Woody Allen is visited by aliens in that movie, and they say you got to go back to making your early, you know, pictures. No, no, you no, know, no, particularly no, no, your no, early no. funny ones. No, 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 it wasn't aliens. It was at a cocktail party. It was this. Uh, a horrible woman at some cocktail party. He says, oh, I, I like your p- pictures, especially the early funny ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But here's the thing about those early funny ones. They're, they're popular for a reason. They are legitimately funny. Uh, you know, the, 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 one of his peers, by the way, at uh, the Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows was Mel Brooks. Oh, <laughs> yeah, another exactly. fucking giant. And, yeah. and, and, and Carl Reiner, the, cre- the creator of the Dick Van Dyke Show, father of Rob Reiner, God help us all, but still, funny man. No, yeah. You know, yeah. This is, you know, so he, all of those kind of like Mel Brooks movies, like, you know, we're going to get all the gags in here we can, and it's going to be, you know, slapstick sight gags and, you know, like movie references and sophisticated references to literature all thrown in. And it's like, you know, it, it, the ultimate, it's the, almost the ultimate Jewish comedy, which is pure irreverence. Nothing is, you know, sacred enough to not be made fun of. And I'm going to use all the techniques I can to get as many jokes in there as possible. Yeah. Uh, he perfected that, you know, yeah. and, you know, it, but you could tell as those movies progressed, you know, bananas, which is, it's just all gags. Mm-hmm. And then things start to get a little bit more consolidated. Like you could tell he's trying to tell a story more. Sleeper has a coherent story in it. Mm-hmm. And Love and Death, similar to Sleeper, a coherent story from beginning to end, uh, but also a reference to literature Mm -hmm. and a reference to Bergman's style of filmmaking. You could tell this is a guy who's like, I want to make a serious film, even Mm -hmm. though, you know, when I mean serious, I don't mean no humor. I just simply mean, I want people are going to recognize me as a guy who, who, who's an artist, who can tell a fucking story. It was going to be impressive. And Annie Hall is sort of like, here I am. This is exactly what I want to do, unmolested by any kind of expectations. Yeah, what's interesting about Annie Hall is uh, the the script developed in a completely different way. It was originally supposed to be a murder mystery, and it was uh, around the Christopher Walken character. I, I forget the details of the plot, but that was the original idea, that it was going to be a murder mystery, and... Um, uh, and somebody got murdered. I forget how. Uh, I forget the details of it. It's not really important. But the material started getting modified more and more by uh, by um, Brickman and um, and Woody Allen as they worked on it. And finally, it became Annie Hall. This uh, sort of like the sine qua non of the serious romantic comedy, which of course, it unlike any comedy, it doesn't. You know, there's there's no happy end. On the contrary, they they break apart. It didn't work out. It's about a failed relationship. That's what the the movie is about. And by the way, the, the issue is always noticed that, and if you don't know it, you should know it, that Annie Hall, the name uh, comes from Diane Keaton because uh, her middle name, I do believe, is Annie and her uh, uh, mother's last name was Hall. That's that's where the name came from. And Correct. It, it, was, it was filmed after his relationship with Diane Keaton had ended. 
so that's that's that, there's a lot of autobiographical stuff going on there. But the key issue artistically is that and and why Annie Hall works so well is because of Gordon Willis, the cinematographer. Gordon Willis, who shot The Godfather, The Conversation, Godfather Part Two, The Paper Chase. I mean, he's just a fucking god of, of uh, cinematography. He was the one who worked with, um, with, with Woody Allen on Annie Hall. And um, the relationship was very much like Orson Welles and Michael Toland in, in Citizen Kane. And what was interesting was that they both pushed each other in ways that were unanticipated by both of them. Uh, specifically, for instance, uh, one of the things that Woody Allen wanted to do was he wanted to have his characters walk around and, and, and come out in the other end of the camera, like walk around the camera and come out the other end. And Gordon Willis was like, well, I've never seen that done before, but you know, why not? You can do it. Why not? Right? And, and that approach was key to creating this notion of the camera is a person witnessing what's going on. Because th that's something really key, and I really want to emphasize this in, in this conversation, that, that people don't re realize the certain techniques that work so effectively in Woody Allen pictures that are so simple yet so subtle that you don't realize it. It's like the Spielberg <laughs> oneer. you know what I mean? Well, it's also, and, and on top of that, almost like just from the way you're telling a story, he takes an idea which you know, it, it isn't too you know too outlandish, but then he builds on it and makes it something more interesting. Yeah. Case in point, the in Annie Hall, fourth wall gets broken quite a number of times. Woody addresses the audience right at the beginning. He says, you know, famous yeah. line. It's like, I adopt the Groucho Marx attitude of I don't want to be part of a club that would have me as a member. But he accelerates it so perfectly in one scene, and it's a scene probably a lot of fans already know where Woody Allen and Diane Keaton are in a line for a movie waiting to be seen. And some smart ass, uh, you know, uh, professor from Columbia University keeps being making pretentious commentary on, to his on day, things. Yeah. Yeah, you know, trying to you impress know, his referencing date. Marshall McLuhan, you know, the high, you know, the, you know, the high intensity medium, and Woody Allen breaks bake, the fourth wall as he's already established that he's done. He goes to the audience, he's like, "What are you gonna? Do? What do you do when you're, you know, you're in front or behind a guy like this in the line? Like, what do you want to do?" And then the character who's been the jerk realizes, "Hey." So he's talking to the fourth wall, and he, he starts talking to the audience. He says, hey, yeah. it's a free country. I have the right to say what I want. And then Woody Allen and him get into a fight, and he says, you know, the guy says, like, hey, I'm a you know professor of TV, media, and culture. So my opinions on Marshall McLuhan have a high degree of validity. And Woody Allen says, okay, you want to play that game? I got Marshall McLuhan right here. He literally pulls out Marshall McLuhan to say, uh, you know nothing of my work. You know, you think my whole <laughs> fallacy is wrong. How you became a, how you had a chance to teach class at a uh, university is amazing. And Woody Allen turns to the audience. He says, "Oh, wouldn't it be great if life were like this?" Yeah. It so you basically saw what happened there. It's like you're breaking the fourth wall, but like let's push a little further. Let's yeah. push a little further. Let's yeah. push a little further. Yeah. And then you just create this you know memorable scene that was like if you just you know were to pitch that cold to someone who had never experienced that, like what the fuck are you doing? Who the fuck are you? What are you talking about? No, There's yeah. A confidence to get there. Yes, it, it's exactly a confidence that it's not merely breaking the fourth wall, like you said. It's building on it. it you know, okay, we broke the fourth wall. Okay, that's surprising. But then here's something that's really going to surprise you. He pulls up Marshall McLuhan, you know, and and and, and Marshall McLuhan, you know, BTFOs the guy, and and yeah, and, and the thing is, see, what I think is key is the end, the end of that gag. Okay, because everything you say I totally is supported, but the end of the gag. What does he say? If only life were like that, right? Exactly. But, but what does that mean? It's basically he is grabbing you by the throat and saying, you've experienced this too, right? Because this, this happens to me, and I was lucky enough that I could get Marshall McLuhan, but you have that thing too. It's that shared humanity. That's the right. subtle and, and indisputable power of Woody Allen. But because in every one of his pictures, there's always this humanity to an understanding of the weaknesses and foibles of the characters, an understanding, more, moreover, that those weaknesses and foibles are the weaknesses and foibles of the audience. Yes. And, and, and that is something rare, because it seems obvious and easy, but you got to stop and think about it. Oh, shit.
uh, sorry about that uh, little uh, accident here. You got to stop and think about it. It's it's actually very very hard to pull off, and Woody Allen pulls it off like a bunch of different fucking times. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. And and it, it's it's you can't dismiss the fact that this is a guy who's very literate, very well read, who could you know who has had those experiences of you know appreciating other people. And you see what what's interesting about him is funny enough he stars in a lot of his movies. All right, so you immediately say what the fucking ego on this guy, and there's a certain degree of ego, but the reality is like when you really look at the Woody Allen character who not only is he just often the butt of the jokes it's more than that it's like there's a fundamental weakness to this guy that he's gonna work through and he's like look yeah it's my weakness I'm very nebbish and everything but I'm willing to bet all of you who are watching this have felt something like this yeah you've experienced something like this and we're gonna work through it or at least I'm gonna try and work through it as best I can it isn't like it's not like you know Woody Allen is envisioning himself as like the you know almost like the un Arnold Schwarzenegger type hero who's going to just resolve everything and if he did it would be for the sake of self-deprecating humor right I mean you know it's there is a humility ironically enough to the guy I think yeah I agree uh there's something else going on um well it, it, look the qualities of the guy are indisputable L let's go a little bit into the intellectuality stuff first um I <sighs> I'm of two minds about um, Woody Allen's use of intellectuality because I think that sometimes he's he's making fun of his characters sometimes of their pseudo intellectuality, and other times I think that he's taking it as fa at face value because see he never he never finished high school never went to college, he does not have the accreditation, and so I think that he has always felt fundamentally insecure about his intellectuality his bona fides as an intellectual, I, I think that he's always been a little bit nervous about it. And so that's right. why he, he tends to put like too much chock-a-block, you know, literary references and shit as if to prove that, see, I'm not stupid. See, I'm educated, even if I didn't go to Harvard or whatever. Because he, he could have easily gone to a great school. I mean, he had the brains for it, right? I don't know if he was a particularly good student because do keep in mind, good students are people who, can, who know how to comply with what is required of them. They are not necessarily brilliant people. And sometimes brilliant people just do not work in the constraints of that system, that educational system, that, that will give you that accreditation. Uh, witness some of the great, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the rich men and, and the great uh, business people like um, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates. I do believe that Warren Buffett didn't finish college, did he? I think he did, actually. Okay. Well, Woody Allen, what, he didn't finish high school or go to college. You think he's stupid? No, nobody's going to say that. Not in their right minds, okay? So, so, but I think that there's always been that insecurity about him. And, and sometimes I think that, I, I sometimes I think that he, when he's not aware, he falls into the trap of like trying to show off how smart he is by, and, and how, how much he's read. And he keeps referring to the same fucking books. It's, it's a little bit tedious at this point. Well, yeah, well, uh, to be, and I think there's some of that, and it, it kind of reminds me of Saul Bellow in that regard, the degree to which, you know, he's creating, you know, like street tough guys who yet nonetheless are like hyper intellectualized. Yeah. But, you know, to his credit, though, a lot of like some of his best uh, intelligent liners are usually at an attempt to deprecate or make fun of like the, the smart asset. Like Annie Hall has two great ones that I'll mention, like one where he's talking to one of his earlier wives or he's remembering his earlier wife and she says oh so and so is from commentary and so and so from dissent he's and Woody Allen said I thought commentary and, dis and dissent had merged to form dysentery <laughs> you know kind of thing uh so you know, those for those who know those are the political agitation prop intellectual garbage magazines of New York the other great line uh, that he has and, and this to me like just strikes fundamentally accurate to college girls that I've been around in when this is back in the day mm -hmm. uh, when Winnie Allen's first uh, hanging out with Annie Hall and he's going through her books as one is wont to do. And he sees a copy of the bell jar and he goes, Sylvia Plath, interesting poetess whose tragic suicide was misinterpreted as romantic by the college girl mentality. You know, just that kind of dismissive, like I know exactly what you're fucking doing here. It was wonderful. And there's like so many of those lines. <laughs> well, no, there's, there's that great line where he's uh, talk. he meets like at, at, at uh, Adley Stevenson rally. He's going to tell jokes before the candidate shows up. And he meets with some political operative woman who would become his future wife or one of his future ex-wives. And he says, oh, so don't tell me you're like one of these um, Jewish intellectuals went to the Adirondacks camps kind of um, – Lefty, commie, Trotskyite kind of things, and, and Wait, she just the best looks line at, is like the yeah. father with the bench on drawings. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the, and at the end of the, this little spiel 
of dissecting her, she, she just stares right back and says, it's wonderful to be dismissed as a series of stereotypes or ha have your life dissected as a series of stereotypes. Because right. what he says is true. And of course, what he says is just incredibly uh, dismissive. I mean, and, and that's why the scene is there, because it shows what kind of a character he is portraying. And, and one would assume that if he's portraying such a character, he's got the self-knowledge to understand that, that such an attitude is really, really fairly despicable. But the thing well, is that he, sometimes he, he, he falls into that. that for real. Well, he summed it right, right at the end of that, that speech. He summed it all perfectly. He says, yeah, I'm a bigot, but for the left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, that, 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 that's a good line. Yeah, but uh, and, yeah, hmm? go ahead. No, 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 you, no. Go ahead. Well, I, the thing is, see, like for instance, my favorite movie and the one that I believe is truly a masterpiece is um, *Crimes and Misdemeanors*. I, I want to get into that. Uh, let's just dive into it because my Do thinking it, yeah. is that the the eighties were his period. The the eighties between eighty three. If if you look at the list of pictures between Zelig. Because this is what happened. He did Annie Hall, masterpiece. Then he did Interiors, which is kind of pretentious, kind of like, you know, trying to be Ingmar Bergman. I don't know why. I don't know why he has this thing with Ingmar Bergman, okay? Um, I, I suspect it has little to do with the artistry of the man and much more to do with a psychodrama uh, that, that's strictly on Woody Allen's side. Because Ingmar Bergman, another great director, indisputably great director, was a man's man. He was a man's man. He, he was a big guy, high testosterone, lots of women, lots of children, just like a big guy. Okay. And, and he would have been a big splash in anything that he had ever done because that's the kind of guy that Ingmar Bergman was. Uh, and I think that Woody Allen has like, if, if you think about it, he is the persona he created, the Woody Allen character, is the antithesis of, of Ingmar Bergman. But I think that precisely because he is the antithesis, he, he yearns for that and yearns to be it and yearns to get the approval of the big man. You, you see what I'm saying? I think that there was always something going on there, some weird psychodrama. And that's why he copied so much of his artistry in, in a lot of places. And it's sort of like, because yeah, Love and Eleven and Death was making fun of him. But then later he tried to copy him. It, it's weird. It was okay? more than tried. He, he basically lifted two, at least two Bergman movies and just completely reproduce them, maybe even more. Which ones? Uh, inter Interiors is more or less a riff of uh, 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 Cries and Whispers. Right. And, and another woman is Wild Strawberries. Okay. I haven't, see, I, I haven't Bergman, seen... For those of you who I, know Bergman, I, I, yeah, these have, words mean something. <laughs> I haven't seen Wild Strawberries. Okay. Yeah, Wild Strawberry is about an old aging professor who's kind of like going back and reflecting on his life and remembering all oh, of Oh, yeah, I did see it. But Another Woman is not uh, Wild Strawberries. Oh, it is. It totally is. Another Woman, the Gina Rollins one. Yeah, yeah, she's going back. She's going. She's a professor of philosophy going back. And, and this proxy woman that she's okay. following, who's okay. a figment of her imagination, is, uh, is, a, is the kind of catalyst for her to look back on her life with her brother, her best friend, her husband. And her yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're, you're actually right. I hadn't thought of that. I was thinking of something completely obscure. I was thinking that uh, I was thinking of the, the Gina Rowland's character's relationship with uh, her, her professor lover, who was this older guy. And right. whom, whose child she aborted, and and the regret she had, and the fight, and yeah, and I was like thinking of that. But then you're, you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, yeah, and I, actually, I did see Wild Star. I'd forgotten. I saw it when I was a teenager. Uh, I didn't think much of it at the time. I, I didn't, and I still don't think much of it. I think that a lot of Ingmar Bergman movies are overrated. Um, I, I'm I'm not I'm not that convinced that he was such a great director. I think that. The, the Swedish thing had a lot to do with people thinking that he was great. But, okay, that's that's for another conversation. Insofar as Woody Allen is concerned, though, the 80s were his peak to me because he had a series of pictures. Okay, Manhattan was the first properly 80s picture, and that is a fucking great picture. I mean, good God. Manhattan is just, oh, I love it. It's beautifully mm -hmm. shot. It's one of the most gorgeously shot pictures ever made. I mean, Gordon Willis, I mean, that was... And did he win an Oscar for that? 
he, I'm pretty sure he, I think he did. It, remember widescreen, real widescreen, black and white. Yeah. At a time when black and white was like, what the fuck are you doing with mm. trying to do this? Yeah. And uh, and yeah, they, I think Woody Allen was because there was a there was a whole string after that of people saying, oh, now black and white is something special to do. Well, it's, it was, it's it an, actually, I'm, I'm looking at the at the year. It was actually 79. And what came right after Manhattan? Raging Bull. Raging Bull. Yeah, another black yeah. and white picture. And then, and then all of a sudden, black and white is cool again. Yeah, because he shot it in, in uh, the 235 aspect ratio. That is uh, 1 by 235, 2.35. And um, it's beautifully, it's gorgeously shot. Uh, oh, man, it, it's just... Uh, there's that he captures the romanticism of New York better than anybody who yeah. ever lived, ever did. Yeah. And and the thing is about Woody Allen, he has worked with a number of different cinematographers over the years, and in every case, he knows enough to just get out of their way. Uh, you know, Robert Altman had that great line that a great director just turns on the camera and gets out of the way of the actors. Yeah, uh, Woody Allen has that attitude. And by the way, as as a as a former film producer, I can say something about Woody Allen that I love. He doesn't take a lot, of, doesn't do a lot of takes. He doesn't micromanage things. He just lets things happen. And um, also, there, there's the other inevitable problem, uh, problem rather, the quality that he has is that he's done it so for so many years, decades now, that with very little effort, he can make things go in the direction that he wants them to go. He doesn't have to yell and scream. He, he just gives a little nudge here and there. And he, by this time, he knows who to nudge to get the result that he wants, right? Actors always say that he pretty much leaves them alone and he lets them do a take or two, and says, are you happy? Yeah, okay, let's move on. And, and he's not like, um, he's not micromanaging. And here's something that's really interesting. Um, as a producer, you love that, because he or shows up on time, does his day, and by five o'clock, he calls it a day. That's it. No matter where, where he's at, he just shuts down the production and moves on. And he always makes his days. Making your days means that you shot the, what you were planning to shoot for that particular day. Therefore, you're on budget. If you're on budget, you're golden. If you're over budget, you know, somebody's going to fucking die, right? So anyway, uh, he always makes his days. But here's something that is really interesting from a directorial perspective. You see, he tends to do like long takes, these takes of conversations that go on for a while. Uh, you know, he's not shooting to cut. For instance, Michael Bay shoots to cut. That is, he shoots a lot of footage that is just going to, you know, slice and dice that stuff with like a Cuisinart, right? Whereas Woody Allen will do a shot, a take that will be 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a couple of minutes. I mean, I've seen um, right. you know, scenes of his that go on quite a bit. He doesn't do the long one -er, you know, like the, like famously the, the Goodfellas one -er that that, you know, lasted for three minutes where they go into the Copacabana. No, he never does those, those self-conscious shots. If he ever, ever does a one -er, it's an invisible one -er. It's a Spielberg one -er, you know, a kind of thing of moving the camera and just focusing it and going from scene to scene, but just to get things moving along and get them quickly. But directorially, the fact that he does these relatively long takes means that he knows when to push the actors so that they accelerate the dialogue. Because, you see, you have to understand, when, you, when you're acting on stage and when you're acting in front of a camera, time, weirdly enough, moves differently. Because, like, when you're doing a scene uh, on a stage, right, and there's this big dramatic moment, this big dramatic pause between two people, and they stare at each other on stage... There is an electricity on the stage because it's, everybody's focused on this two, the confrontation between the two characters. Whereas that same confrontation on screen, if they just stare at each other, you know, they, they, somebody said some zinger to the other and they stare at each other like a confrontational moment. If that confrontational moment goes on too long, it sort of like sags. It, it, right. Okay. There's a difference between real life and film. That's why, for instance, you ever see somebody who's just ordinary looking, but you take a picture of them and they're gorgeous or the opposite. Sometimes people are fairly good looking, but you take a picture of them and you're like, they don't look very attractive. You know, uh, yeah, it, it's there is a difference between real life and the camera. And Woody, Woody Allen knows how to just push his actors along just enough so that they make it. They, they, they do what's necessary. And it's incredible because you never feel a, a sense in his pictures that they sag, even with these long takes. Sometimes some of his pictures aren't very good, but they're never boring. Well, that's the thing is in, in this is 
something which you see happen in a number of different artistries within the film industry, which is those who are really good at what they're doing, you don't notice the craft or technique. It's not even necessarily just the director mm -hmm. or the writer. It, you know, it's sometimes also actors like, you know, uh, famously, they, they, you know, they would say guys like Fred McMurray never won an Oscar because he made it look so damn easy like he was never acting. Right. Kind of similar with Woody Allen. It's like you never you you never I shouldn't say never. You mostly never notice his directing. You know, like he doesn't have like a special shot. They say, yeah. Ooh, it was crazy how he made that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, there were certain some cinematography stuff for sure. But, you know, you credit that to the cinematographers. He is servicing the content and you know in and, and what's funny about it is that even though there's no particular shot or technique you could necessarily say that's the Woody Allen there is a Woody Allen tone that you cannot deny yeah in all of these movies yeah so anyway just to go you're absolutely right and but I want to go back to this you know in Annie Hall somehow it clicked and it, a lot of the tools that he that appeared in Annie Hall you know, he would go on to apply them in other movies. You know, uh, uh, principally, the, the thing that I'm, I'm so impressed by, and it seems so trivial, is his position of the camera. Whenever he's in an interior, he only allows the camera to pan. He never uh, does a tracking shot. He never does a zoom in, okay, unless it's like a joke, okay? But it's always, um, the camera is, it, it's not always on a tripod, because like, uh, as we'll discuss later, you know, in... in um, uh, uh, what was this picture? Uh, uh, husbands and wives. The camera is all handheld, uh, mm -hmm. but but the the thing that he he does with the camera in a, such a subtle way is that he makes sure that the camera is a person in the scene observing it. Oh, all right, this is different than what a lot of directors do, because like for instance, take take somebody like David Fincher. Uh, David Fincher, he believes truly that there is such a thing as an objective camera. That there is, you know, there, there are only two possibilities and the other one is wrong, okay? And, and now, this is very important insofar as David Fincher's uh, attitude towards film because he, he believes in a godlike perspective, the omniscient perspective that has captured the perfect perspective, all right? Now, now that's an artistic decision, an artistic approach. Uh, I, nobody's here to say that that's a bad approach or not. It's just his approach. And, and you see it all the time in the way that he shoots, the way he will have his camera track the actor as he moves. Even when he moves and tilts his head, he will follow along, okay? That, that kind of attitude, that, that kind of approach to, uh, to, 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 uh, to the camera movement, right? Uh, that's Fincher. But what Woody Allen is doing is that he's usually, usually, usually he's using a, it looks like a 35 to 50 millimeter lens, which is the, the lenses that closest approach what an actual human eye can perceive, the, the field of vision that it can perceive. And um, he usually has it at eye level, and he has a camera panning that is moving from side to side as, as if like a neck that turns from side to side. But mm -hmm. the camera does not move. Now, that makes you feel that you're there, that you're very inserted into the scene that's going on. He's not cutting like a close-up of one person and a close-up of the other one. By the way, that's the other reason why his films are so cheap, because he's not doing a lot of close-ups. And because he's not doing a lot of close-ups, uh, you know, he's doing these, uh, what other directors would say, master shots, right? What they're doing, what he's doing, rather, is that he's becoming very efficient. He can cover a lot of pages in relatively little amount of film time, of, of filming days. I mean, his pictures, uh, from what I understand, they usually take like between three weeks and six weeks to finish, which is fast for the kind of material that he's doing. I, I'm, I'm going on and on. I mean, I, I think I might be boring you at this time. No, 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 no. That, I mean, I think you, you, you hit it right. I mean, but the thing that, I've, um, that I'm getting through all of this, right, is, you know, what is he... Hang on, hang on. So can I interrupt you for a second? You know, like, we're, we're shooting the shit, right? We're, we're doing the podcast, right? But we're doing it like bowling. And, and like you and I have discussed this. I'm going to leave this into the podcast, by the way. That we have to do it more like fucking tennis. And and like I felt like I like, I was like bowling. So so your you audience and, well, and okay. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll be, well, I'll be I'll be I'll be brutally bl uh, blunt with you. I you were going into things I mostly didn't care about. 
Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so by that I mean, yeah, sure, we can talk about his the the film camera technique and, technique and shit like that. But you don't give a shit. His camera thing. I really don't. Uh, I I basically want to know what he's at, you know what's the whole point of all of that. Uh, and I think you know the point of all of that is that he has uh, confidence in the narrative he's kind to say, and he has confidence in the actors to deliver it and what have you. And the techniques of film is just sufficiently what he needs to get there. And so yeah. if that's yeah. you know kind of in mind, you know you can be very efficient at that because you're just doing what I literally need to do. Yeah. And you know, the thing that's interesting to me is the nature of you know as he progresses over time you know because I, I i wonder about this does he continually evolve in saying new things he wants to say or does he kind of reach a plateau point i think he reaches a plateau think, yeah i do too and i think you know i think when you say uh crimes and misdemeanors being kind of like a high point yeah yeah there's some good pictures after that for sure mm -hmm. but that certainly seems like a last very great one yeah yeah Okay, the, the thing I love about crimes and misdemeanors, and as a writer, I, I look at it and I'm like, Jesus, so fucking envious. It is so hard to combine comedy and drama. And you know, Woody Allen himself would try to do it uh, again later with Melinda and L Melinda, and it didn't work. Uh, it wasn't a bad picture. I mean, like, even Woody Allen's bad pictures are not that terrible, although there are a couple that are really crap. I, I'm thinking specifically of celebrity and... Um, uh, uh, the, the 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 to Rome with love. Good God, that was those were. Well, I actually saw Melinda Melinda in a local, not really like an art house theater. It's almost like a community like yeah. movie house theater. And my friend and I were you know big Woody Allen fans. And like I said, there was around the time of you know like really like a first summer after co after my first year of college. Mm -hmm. We're in there. We're watching it. We're like this is kind of dull and we were yeah. like not very interested in it at all. And like, yeah, I get what he's doing. And there's a couple, you know, jokes and that are interesting. And Will, uh, I think Will Ferrell's doing it, you know, his interesting take on the Woody Allen persona. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's like, it's like the drama, you know, cause they use the same actor, one uh, actress as Melinda, uh, one side drama, one side comedy with different actors in different scenes. And there's some compelling actors in there, but I'm like, Especially the drama just felt so fucking tedious. Yeah, I and I actually, I would have. I thought it would have been better if it had been all of the same actors playing all of the same roles. I agree. That's actually a much better idea. Yeah, I, I think it would have been just a lot funnier, uh, or, or or more interesting. But it's the thing is, he it felt like he was rehashing an idea that he had done better in in Crimes and Misdemeanors. Uh, uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors is basically uh, uh, about a, a ophthalmologist who murders his mistress. And, uh, and he gets away with it. And at the same time, there's this Nebuchadnezzar character played by Woody Allen, who's just a fucking retard. And he's trying to seduce this woman played by um, Mia Farrow. And Mia Farrow winds up going, of course, off, with, yeah. Yeah, going off with Alan Alda, who's this big time uh, uh, television producer. It's just, you know, it's kind of, kind of like... You know. He's like a big idiot. I mean, yeah. he's, it's like one of those guys... Because Woody Allen plays this so well. Because Woody Allen, you could tell the character he's playing is a guy with a lot more creative talent in the sense of like artistic integrity, what have you, but it is a schlub. A schlemiel is never going to really have success. Alan Alda... No, Alan Arkin or Alan... No, Alan Alda. I mix oh, the two yeah. names all the time. Alan Alda. Alan Alda is, you know, this sort of like an, a real idiot, but he's like, he can make hits left, right, and center. Like, yeah, he's, for he's those, of, those of you, those of you know his, the phrase that it comes from this movie, it's like, comedy is just tragedy plus time. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the, the, you know, the joke of that was that a guy is such an idiot, like he's just going to construct this ridiculous <laughs> summary theory of like what's saying what comedy is. No, no, he, no he's, he, he says the, the other, the line was, if it bends, it's funny. If it breaks, if it breaks, it's not funny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, which is actually kind of true. And 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 by the way, I I love the fact that Alan Alda, in a very real sense, was sort of almost spoofing himself because Alan Alda, of course, was a big time television producer, and Alan Alda played him. I mean, really, he just he went for the gold. You know, he really did it. Pull, pull, everybody acts brilliantly, and Martin Landau does a brilliant job as the ophthalmologist. Uh, who murders his um, mistress, who's played by Angelica Houston. That's that's another thing. You know, this son of a bitch, Alan, uh, Woody Allen, he gets fucking primo talent to show up. I'm surprised, though, that he hasn't gotten people like uh, Jack Nicholson or Clint Eastwood. Guys, were, were, that, that, that's interesting. You know what I mean? That is, that is an interesting thing. I think for the case of Jack, by the time that, you know, it would have been around to do Woody Allen stuff, Jack was, you know, chasing big bucks here, and he was, you know, doing that kind of thing. Um, Clint, I think was by that time also like, he was like, he had his own project. He's like, oh, what am I going to do? The, 
a nebbish the nebbish Clint Eastwood character. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't work. The closest he came to is uh, those uh, those monkey movies. What were they called? Uh, oh, they were great. They're, they, I love those are fun. Yeah. Yeah. They were um, very fun. Any which way but loose. Uh, any which. And way any which can. way you can. Yeah, yeah, they were funny. The ones but, left turn, Clyde. Yeah, yeah, but so so um, yeah, Woody, I think also Woody Allen must get the talent you know fairly cheaply because I know Woody ain't oh, burning yeah. through cash. No, no, to no. no. These Woody, Woody Allen. Everybody knows that you work for scale on the Woody Allen picture. He, he just tells uh, you're going to get scale. That's that. That's that. Show up or don't show up. I don't care. I'll find somebody else if you do. He's basically the Mr. Medicare of film. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's gonna show up. Nobody's gonna charge him a dime over over the bare minimum. No, you know, yeah, he could do whatever he wants. Um, and, and so, it, it, you know, we we transition to this whole issue of the Mia Farrow allegation and and that whole thing. Or, or you want to you want to finish up on, on well, the just issue one, of the just films. one thing on crimes and misdemeanor. Why I think crimes and misdemeanor works and mm -hmm. Melinda and Melinda doesn't mm -hmm. because Woody the character that Woody Allen plays and the character that. Uh, Martin Landau play exist in the same world and are both real people. Yeah. The fact that Melinda and Melinda is a as the conceit of a film, like I'm going to keep the same actress but have the same plot but told different ways. It's like, oh, I see what he's doing. It's an exercise. Remember when I said Woody Allen work, you know, has this artistry, which by he you cannot tell he's directing, but you know it's a Woody Allen film. The yeah. conceit of the director was so apparent in that that I'm like, okay, I know what I'm watching. Yeah. It's it's an interesting exercise, but it's an exercise, and exercises always are never the real deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, w one of the things I also like very much about uh, Woody Allen's career, though, uh, is that he does a picture every year. He just grinds them out every year, and he writes them all uh, himself, and he, and he directs them, and, and he his producer is his sister, I believe. And, and he tends to work with the same people over time. And yeah, if he's grinding one out every year, it's just basically, you know, steady gig for everybody involved. So of course they're going to do it. And he gets his financing is because his pictures are so cheap, uh, he usually makes money on all of his pictures. There was a series of pictures that he did. Um, it was um, Hollywood Ending and anything else that were very expensive. I forget which of the two. I think Hollywood Ending was actually a big budget Weinstein or, or Miramax picture. And it fucking flopped. Because Woody Allen is good with a little picture. It doesn't cost uh, under 10 million bucks. Uh, and it, it'll recoup money. Uh, that's the kind of director he is, and he wants to be that because he's got his audience. People will go to see a Woody Allen picture. Uh, you, me, we will go and see <laughs> all of his pictures. And um, yeah, because if only to see, well, is, is he going to bring it this time or not quite? Because, Precisely. Yeah. Because once in a while he does bring it. Uh, his late career move of uh, to, uh, to, excuse me, Midnight in Paris, which was 2011, he won an Oscar for the script. And it's a, it's a great script. It's a, a, a fantastic script, actually. And it works very well. Uh, uh, and it's got a terrific cast, and it's beautifully shot, and it's just a lovely little picture. Um, I think his last great picture, though it was not in the primo category of Annie Hall, Manhattan, Crimes and Misdemeanors, is Match Point. Uh, or you think and it's half, up there? And, no, no, I think that's right. And half the shock of that, and it, I, people said it at the time, you know, up until that point, Woody Allen is like, oh, he's filming in New York. It's a New York film. What's his next New York film? It's going to be interesting. Oh, he's shooting in London. What? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It went a, through a period. Yeah. And what was he, interesting, yeah, it's a, he lost financing or he got financing from Europe. I forget how the story go, goes, but it was basically that. It was a financing issue. And he said, you know, changing it from the Hamptons to London, uh, you know, New York and the Hamptons to London and the British countryside. It was a snap. And um, yeah, so, so he made it, um, he made Match Point. And that's an interesting picture because it's really fucking serious. Uh, there is no joke in that picture. I, I don't see a single joke in it. And um, I remember reading the Roger Ebert uh, review of it, and he said that it's basically a film about four awful people. I mean, really horrible yeah. people. And yeah, yeah and, and, and I mean, three awful people, because they're all horrible. And it, it also involves the murder of a mistress um, by the main character. And it, mm -hmm. it, it's basically half of Crimes and Misdemeanors. But what was interesting was that in in um, match point, it was more it was more readily apparent the um, how can I put it? I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get at something here that I think that match point did a little better than um, than uh, crimes and misdemeanors because in crimes and misdemeanors the character of Martin Landau was already established. 
he had the wife, he had the kids, he had the right. big practice, the uh, ophthalmological practice. He had his position, you know, everybody knew him. And the, the movie introduces the character where basically he's getting an award, you know, and, and there's a man up on stage behind a, 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 a podium there singing his praises. He's already a man who is established, whereas Match Point was much more interesting because it was a young man who had not yet established himself, who was trying to. He was in the process of it and who was committing a fatal mistake. And he knew he was committing a fatal mistake by being involved with his woman. You know, and, and that's yeah, more yeah, interesting John, to me. Exactly. Jonathan, the Jonathan Reese Myers character is the, you know, it, it, like Barry Lyndon, he's, he's ascending the ladder. Yeah. Right. And so, and what's interesting also is that the, the big difference between the characters, the Martin Lando character in Crimes and Misdemeanors, his whole arc is about... I have done something wrong out of immediate fear and wanted to resolve it quickly. And then, oh, I, I feel this guilt and I'm ready to break from it. And then he realizes, oh, I can I can live with it. It's fine. Jonathan Reese Myers, it's much more tactical almost, which is I, I'm making a cold calculation. I'm The question of feeling guilty about this isn't entirely my main concern right now. Yeah, yeah. And what was interesting is that all the characters, it's so clear, they are all buying one another. And it was, yeah. it, was, it was kind of horrifying because at least in Crimes and Misdemeanors, there was the, the sense that there was true love and true fear. There was actually the sense that Martin Landau was afraid not just of losing his position, but of losing his wife. And was, his soul. Yeah. Yeah. The most, one of the most important parts of that movie is he's reflecting as a kid and his father's a rabbi and his, you know, the moral teachings of his father and what, you know, what degrading thing he has done. Uh, as a result of that, and his father's moral implications of like evil will out and everything, and his confrontation with that. There is no moral confrontation directly in the characters. There's a moral point to the movie, but it's uh, it, it, it's from the uh, external audience viewing in and the director constructing, not from the characters realizing. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's how can I put it? Um... There's something about Match Point, though, that does not rise to greatness. And I'm actually kind of curious as to what, what, why do you think that it doesn't quite get there? There's a, there's a, this is going to sound stupid, hope, hopefully not, but I, I worry that it will. It's too cool. It's too slick. You know what I mean? I, I can see like, wow, this is a Woody Allen movie. It felt a little different, but like, there's a, a almost like a glossiness of like the, oh, look at these nice apartments and these nice, you know, almost like a nice clean shots to everything and everybody looks so pretty and beautiful and well put together. There, there It lacks that kind of like, you know, snot on the nose that you get in like There's some of the iciness, other ways. An iciness yeah, to it. Yeah, iciness, exactly. And, and even the colors are like that muted blue, cold blue, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, because like, for instance, I, I think that you're right. There was like, for instance, the, the, the part that I found um, uh, kind of weird was when um, the, the, the Scarlett Johansson character and the Jonathan Reese Myers character are in a hotel room or something and they're fucking. But he, they, they weren't fucking. He was like spreading like cream on her, but she was fully dressed or something. There was a, a, a lack of heat. Yeah. It, it, it didn't seem... Okay, the, the, the scene, you certainly believed it could have happened between the two of them, but I think that the film uh, chose the wrong scenes to show them together. The, there was not like a, like, 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 a, like a heat between them. I'm just laughing over the fact that you know, you're not going to convince people you're a young man by having you know the image of icy and hot in the same <laughs> in the same breath of thirty seconds. Sorry, I had to go there. No, uh, yeah, I, I didn't notice. Uh, but my 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 thinking in, in the picture is that it it he didn't show like the the insanity of desire. I think that that's yeah. the, the point, especially for young people, because. As you get older, you, you just naturally start to control your sexual desire much more. Uh, you, you don't lose your shit over some, you know, whatever girl you're with. And a lot of times you can be, you know, head over heels in love, quote unquote, which is really lust. And uh, realize it. When you're younger, you don't. You think that you're actually in love. When What's going on really is that you don't love her. You don't even know her sometimes. What you, you, what you are is just sexually attracted to somebody who wants to be with you. And so you think this is love. It's not love. It's just you're really fucking hot for one another. And you're banging like fucking, you know, little bunnies, right? But 
that doesn't mean anything. It, it does not and, mean you, you know, here's the thing also about that movie. I think it's getting to where you're going at. Um, it's been a, several years, a long time since I've watched it, and I can't remember the eroticism to it yeah. in a clear kind of way. You know what I mean? And yeah. that was at a time when, like, you know, this was before she started talking in a social setting. Scarlett Johansson was like a you know, hot shit for a kid like my age. I mean, sure. you know, the the hot, you know, movie, you know, um, you know, uh, Lost in Translation. It's like, holy shit, this is attractive woman and all of that things. And oh, here she is, like, you know, and and something that's you know, kind of like a thriller and everything. It should have been memorable, and it wasn't. Yeah, in a way. At hey, least I can't recall that. No, she wasn't. Okay, so we have the eroticism of Match Point, or the lack of eroticism. Now, comp compare that to Hannah and her sisters. Uh, th that's a picture where you, you have, of course, a Michael Caine character who's like besodden with, um, with uh, what was the name of this actress? She was so goddamn hot. The, uh, Hershey, Barbara yeah, Hershey. Barbara Hershey, yeah. And he was married to Mira Farrow and lusted after Barbara Hershey and wound up having an affair with her. If I, if they, they actually did cons consummate the affair, They right? consummated, yeah. Yeah. Which okay, that that alone shows fucking low moral character. I mean, that that's something else. That I don't know if Woody Allen is conscious or not of the low morality of his characters, or he just says that oh, that's the way people are. I mean, I think he he's it's both, right? I think he could recognize that it, it, it's a thing that's troubling because it certainly troubles the characters, but I think he would also recognize that that's the motivation that people have, so that's why I'm depicting it. Hmm. Yeah, well, because we remember, because remember the the uh, the Michael Caine character in Hannah and Her Sisters does feel guilty about it. He wants to almost like out it and and whatnot, but he still lusts after, you know, Barbara Hershey. And you know, it's it's funny in that it's I remember those erotic moments, if not, but or at least, or at least the courting of it, and you know, like how he wants to tell her that he loves her, and he's uh, you know recommending like E.E. E. Cummings poems and uh, just you know randomly it's like you know. You know, he thinks to himself in a voiceover, it's like, I'll just go over there and tell her I have feelings for her and she'll understand. And, you know, this and he's structuring it. And as soon as she's like in comes into the camera shot, he just grabs her and kisses her. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. OK. Hannah and her sisters is is like on, a, on the one hand, like a shaggy dog story. It, it Because it's got like just a, a bundle of shit that's going on in in the, in the movie. And I, I remember watching it when it came out. I enjoyed it very much. I thought it was a very funny movie uh, because it is very funny. I thought as I got older, I thought I, I started thinking of it very seriously and yeah. realizing also that it, it does happen that you start falling in love with people who are in your immediate family and are completely inappropriate uh, or your immediate family or immediate social circle uh, because you, you, what happens is that proximity and, and getting to know somebody over time, you start to realize their qualities. And sometimes it is the case that you realize that the person you're with is not as cool as this other person that would be completely inappropriate for you to be with. You know, like, a, like the, the sister of your woman or the best friend of your woman or something like that. Precisely, yes. And, and it's, it's a very troubling thing. I wish he'd explored that tragedy a little bit more. He was making a comedy. But... It is a tragic situation. It is a tragic situation when you realize that you married the wrong sister. You know, I, I think that that ultimately, if it, if it had been more realistic, it would have been about that. He married the wrong sister because she was just, you know, this uh, mother to everybody. And by the way, I always had the feeling that Hannah and her sisters was him realizing that he didn't really want to be with Mia Farrow. You know, there's a good, great story of that. I saw Michael Caine interviewed not too long ago where he was saying there was a scene where he was in bed and Woody is directing him to say, I, I don't want to move to the country and I don't like children. And Mia turned to Michael Caine and said, you know, I think Woody's trying to tell me things through you in this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I would not be. So, uh, so in other words, you, you, it's spot on. You're, that observation is, seems to be spot on. I had never heard of that anecdote and I would not be surprised because, uh, well, let's transition to this whole Mia Farrow thing. Um, a lot of people are wondering now in this whole Me Too movement why all these actors would consistently work with me, with uh, Woody Allen ever since the allegations came to light in 1992, I believe it was. Well, because everybody yeah. in Hollywood knows that Mia Farrow is out of her fucking mind. She's fucking nuts. I mean, nuts, nuts, right? And she has the public persona of being like this earth mother, but she's crazy. I mean, she's really fucking crazy, right? And, well, it's coming out with this whole uh, Moses Farrow um, uh, blog post 
<laughs> that he talks about how two of the of his of her adopted children committed suicide, you know, and and how she abused them horribly, horrifically for decades. Jesus, it, it sounds like a fucking family out of a fucking you know V.C. Andrews novel for crying out loud. Well, you and I had the talk about like you know there's a certain kind of woman. It, it could be a person too, but it's more often a woman who treats kids as either like toys or pets. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, and, that's and, that case. And, and here's the thing. Like I told you in that conversation, uh, you, you never know until she's had the kid. You, you can't predict it. it it's something you, you will never know if a, mother, if a woman is going to be a good mother until she has actually had the kid. I, look, I, I've seen it all. I've seen women who were like these party girls and what have you and got pregnant and didn't want to have the kid. They had the kid and all of a sudden they just changed and they were just like the kid and everything else could, you know, go out the fucking window. And there are other women who were like the nice girls who were like all fine and they wanted to have a family. They talked about having a big family. They had the kid and all of a sudden they're like, oh, screw the kid. Leave him with the nanny or the grandparents or whoever the fuck. I want to go out and party. You never know. You never know how uh, the, the, the postpartum hormones are going to affect a woman. You, you just do not know. And it's not just postpartum depression, man. It's, it's like... You know, it, it's, yeah, but that, that's for a different conversation. About, about Mia Farrow, man, she's just fucking nuts. And she treated everybody like shit, you know? And this is, and, and, we, and I, I told you this as well, and you probably already knew it. Like, she's one who has held grudges about relationships in the past. Remember, she used to be the, the main squeeze wife of Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And, you know, around the time that she made Rosemary's Baby, they got divorced. And I, you, if you ever watch, like, or listen to, like Bob Evans or any of the people who were producing that film talk about Mia Farrow and how she was using the success of that movie to like really stick it to Frank, mm. have a little fun at that, see what kind of person Mia Farrow is. She, she's a horrible person. And so to believe that she made up the story is, is in my mind, perfectly reasonable. I don't know if I've, I've told in the podcast the story of my sister. Uh, uh, who thinks that you know she went ice skating? Yeah, I, I, oh, you got to tell that story. I don't think you told it. Okay, well, I'll tell the story re real br briefly. And this is a true story. My my sister's like seven years younger than me, and one time years ago, I mean decades ago, she was uh, she was what she was about four years old, five years old, and she very badly wanted to go ice skating with us. It was a group of us, uh, me and some cousins, and she was way too small. But she whined and cried and tantrum, you know, like a five year old would usually do. And so my uncle, who was driving us over. Uh, said, okay, fine, I'll take her, okay, and, and he put her up, up front in the seat next to him, and uh, we drove out, it was a, I remember it was a big old Volvo station wagon, right, it was a bunch of us, a gaggle of kids, and we got to the, um, to the um, ice skating rink, and my sister had fallen asleep, so my uncle did, of course, he picked her up, and, and just carried her along, she was five years old, little girl, and we all went skating, we were there for an hour or two, or whatever, and, um, you know, at the end of the, the afternoon, or whatever, we were going back, um, to the house and my um and my sister on the drive back woke up okay and she said are we there yet and my uncle to tease her you know just just you know very innocently he said yes of course we're coming back and you ice skated so incredibly and the way you ice skated backwards and how you did pirouettes and all the rest of it and and my sister was like yeah 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 and she convinced herself okay now, he, here's the crazy thing. I mean, we all laughed at this at the time. Uh, we, and we egged her on. We kept on telling her, yeah, this happened, you know. And you, you, you know, skated faster than all of us and all, all kinds of crazy-ass stories about her. And here's the thing. My uh, sister is a 44-year-old woman, um, you know, grown woman with children of her own and all the rest of it. And she says that to this day, uh, she has vivid, vivid memories of her ice skating faster than all of us and doing all kinds of pirouettes and, and like, you know, skating backwards and all the rest of it. She has these incredibly vivid memories, but here's the catch. You see, she never learned to ice skate. That hmm. is how suggestible a child can be. Because my sister, and she finds it funny because it is funny. It's a very innocent story. And, and my uncle who's passed away and you know, may you rest in peace, you know, uh, it's, it's one of our fondest memories of our uncle because he, he pulled this one on, on my sister and she says that she sees it. She has these incredibly vivid memories of this event and she knows for a fact that they never happened because she never learned to ice skate. She cannot to this day, she, she wouldn't bother because, you know, she's going to make a fool of herself, right? So that's how suggestible people's memories can be. 
a child can easily, you can easily convince them of anything. And I've seen it. I have uh, toddlers of my own now. You, you tell them a story enough times, they believe it. They believe whatever you tell them to because their imaginations, their minds are plastic. They are malleable. And so to, to the, the Dylan Farrow situation that she believes that she's mol she was molested by Woody Allen, I have no doubt in my mind that she truly believes this and that she sees it in her own head. And I also have no doubt in my mind that it never happened. That it was just exactly, yeah. I I believe this uh, because the thing is, see, it's not that I believe this because I think that Woody Allen is such a great guy. I think it's a little bit creepy that he went and fucked um, his uh, girlfriend's nineteen-year-old daughter. Although within the realms of the understandable, you know, because you're always going for younger, tighter, hotter. That's normal. But it, it's kind Precisely, of like yeah. you know what we were talking about before that sometimes you know. Uh, the, the, the person in your family that you're attracted to might not be the most appropriate. And by the way, this ties back into Hannah and her sisters. Perhaps even at that time, he was kind of lusting after, you know, Sun Yi or, or whatever, or maybe somebody else in the family. Who knows? Who knows what was going on there? I don't really want to know. But I have no doubt that he did not molest this child as she claims and as Mia Farrow insists he did. Well, and, and like I've always said this before, and you know, we could debate what the meaning of it behind it is, but it, you know, it it seems odd that the you know that he this little girl that he went after or what have you is still the wife that he still has. He's still married to Sunny. He's been married to her and been with her longer than any other person on the fucking planet. Yeah, you know, it, it, there's a there's a chance, right, that you know maybe it's as it's as innocent as it superficially looks. Who knows? I mean, we're, we're never going to know. You don't know. Yeah, you don't I, know. I don't you don't really, know. like I said, I don't really want to know. The fact that they've been together for going on 30 years now, well, it's 26 years. Uh, okay, that, that and, and, and there are all kinds of accusations that she's retarded and blah, 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 and she's not. Apparently she has, like, you know, she's got degrees, a higher education, or what have you. But look, the, the, the Moses Farrow stuff that's come out, basically this long blog, blog post saying that Mia Farrow is crazy. Well, this is pretty much common knowledge in Hollywood. Everybody knew that she's fucking nuts. Um, the issue becomes, how can I put this? This Me Too movement, it glorifies uh, self-victimization. And I think that it's just going to go from, you know, it's going it's to get worse, a lot worse, before people sort of like, you know, pull out of this death spiral. Really, because before people pull out. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to go there. I'm a 12-year-old. <laughs> yeah, but you you know what I'm saying, right? I know exactly what you're saying, and it's funny enough. I think I had told you right at the beginning uh, when the Me Too stuff was happening, uh, right around the time when Harvey Weinstein was first getting accused, and like a few other things. Woody Allen himself said, "You, you know, watch out. This thing's going to turn into a witch hunt." Yeah, yeah. Well, what, uh, what's his name? Harvey Weinstein. As we're recording this, surrendered to the to the New York prosecutor's office or something. You know, he did, yeah. Yeah, he's going to get charged and, and like the whole thing. You know, uh, that's not going to end well. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, man, he, he didn't play his cards smart, okay? Uh, when, the, when this shit started breaking, look, it was the recording. You know that that recording of, of I know him. exactly, oh, and it, you know, the worst part about that recording wasn't that you know this was an aggressive guy who was going to get what he wanted. The worst part of that recording is how whiny and pleading. let's be honest, how pleading. Jewish he was. It no, was pleading. a Jew. I, I don't Come know. Come on, that. you want to grab my you know, my thing and the, the thing? It's it's almost like Jerry Lewis was doing. It. And, don't you want to <laughs> grab the thing with the duty? And it's oh, lady, don't lady. Yeah, it, it, it was just whiny and pleading and kind of pathetic. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, Harvey <laughs> Weinstein, <laughs> also, Harvey Weinstein was a fucking cocksucker. I mean, like, like, a, like, yeah. in terms of business, he was an asshole. And well, he that's did, why he I wouldn't, think he it, wouldn't pay his writers. He did all kinds of nasty shit, right? Uh, you really had to threaten him to get, uh, the things that you were owed from him. Okay. So he's getting his comeuppance. Fine. I could give a fuck. Blank well, fuck that's the him. thing. That's why I think for him, it was so aggressive because it's like, you know, we all remembered when you tried to fuck us over in yeah. some capacity, independent of the, you know, the sexual allegations. And so now is the chance for us to do what, what you want unto to you, you as you're falling, which we've wanted to do what we're afraid to. Yeah. Exactly. I think a lot of people just ganged up and they're like, oh, this is going to be fucking great. But yeah, he was a fool. You know, he was a fool with this, with this also. And also, well, I think we talked about the other day the Morgan Freeman shit, but that, that seems to be blowing over quickly because it seems just so paltry. 
Well, here's the other thing, and I think it's worthwhile for this conversation is that uh, you know my gut is outside of like a few swipes at Woody, and you know some people saying, "Oh, I will never work with him." I, I honestly don't think Woody's really going to get really burned by this thing. No, 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 it's no, no. I, I, I disagree. I, I, I disagree. Potentially, he, he, he could see it. He see it become very difficult for him to work with actors from Hollywood. He might have better luck with French actors and and European actors generally, because they all respect him and they think that this is all just a bunch of bullshit. Okay, I mean, objectively, it is bullshit. It, it is complete and utter bullshit. And you start like uh, like making a scorecard of you know you believe Mia or Woody, and and just on the facts of their lives, you you start like um, you know adding things up, and and Woody comes out the much better for it, because he's just worried about making his pictures. He doesn't give a shit about anything else, and he's married to this woman for twenty odd years, you know, um, the Sun Yi, and whereas uh, Mia Farrow is just this fucking nightmare, you know. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I think that they're, uh, I think that the European actors would, would work with him. The, but the Hollywood actors, they might realize that they, they just can't afford to socially. And, 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 and in Hollywood, by the way, everything social is business at the end of the day. That they cannot socially afford to work with him, and so they'll beg off. And, you know, in maybe five years or something, when this is all cooled down, what is inevitably blown up, and, and everybody realizes, you know, what the fuck were we thinking? That's when things will, you know, tidy up for Woody Allen insofar as his reputation is concerned. But we really don't know because it, it, this Me Too thing happened right after he had finished making A Rainy Day in New York, where half the actors on that picture said, oh, I regretted working with him and I'm donating my salary, which is chump change, to uh, the Me Too movement or some feminist cause or some shit like that. And here's the thing with Woody, right? I mean, like, he's already 82. Um, in five years from now, obviously he'll be uh, uh, 87, yeah. and you know probably he could very well be in the grave. We don't know. Um, I think he's moved, he's beyond the point of his artistic reputation really being at any real risk. You know what I mean? Long and term, I think no, that, nobody cares. I mean, no, exactly. he he made his he made his bones, if you will. Yeah. Hello. No, no, go, go ahead. I was. Uh, you, you, it sounded like you were going to continue. No, no, no. I was just interjecting that. But go ahead. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. So, 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 to the end of the day, you know, like that's why I, my attitude is like at the end. You know, I don't see this, you know, m causing much long-term damage for him in any kind of way. I agree with you. Yeah, in the next few years, okay, is he going to have a hard time with Hollywood? So be it. You know, but so what? Maybe he goes back to filming in Europe again. I mean, it's not like it stopped him, you know, before. And I don't think he has the mentality to where he's he's going to stop making films for it. You know what I mean? And he'll figure out a way. Uh, to keep going. He's, he's a sharp customer. And by the way, uh, you know, his parents died exceedingly old. I mean, I think they, they both crossed the 100 year mark. Um, so I think that we actually were going to have a lot of Woody Allen ahead of us. Okay. Uh, my thinking is that it's going to be, in terms of the work, it's going to be spotty. Okay. Because, like, for instance, I'm looking at his last pictures, right? Um, starting with. Uh, okay, Match Point, which is like the second, the, you know, the final stretch of his career. There's Match Point, then Scoop. Um, I don't remember that one. Oh, yeah, it was um, with Scarlett Johansson. It didn't work. It was a comedy. It didn't work because she's yeah. not fu fundamentally, she's not funny. Uh, Cassette, because he wanted to make her be like a fast talking kind of, you know, but she's not. Then there exactly. was Cassandra's Dream, which was, it didn't work at all. Uh, I mean, I couldn't get through it, frankly. Uh, I don't even think it, yeah, yeah, I didn't even get a chance to see it. Like, I was telling you, like, I'm spotty when it comes to, like, that post-match yeah. point, Melinda, Melinda kind of stuff. Like, some stuff I saw, a lot of it I didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, not to say, to your point, it's not like, I'm pretty sure if I were to watch most of them, I wouldn't say that is completely, you know, like, zero star kind of thing. But, you know, not compelling enough to say, okay, I, I have to see it. Yeah. But here, here's something. Then comes Vicky Cristina of Barcelona. Um, a couple of pictures later, Midnight in Paris, and a couple of pictures after that, Blue Jasmine. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that Woody Allen, I mean, it, it, it's funny, ironic that, that, you know, he's getting hit with this Me Too shit. He knows women and writes women brilliantly. I mean, so evocatively and so knowingly of all kinds of women. Okay, I'm, I'm highlighting a couple of pictures here. I'm talking about Vicky Cristina Barcelona, uh, Midnight in Paris, the Rachel McAdams role there, and I'll get to it. It's a minor role, but it's important. And Blue Jasmine. Um, think also, about, how many? How, think of how many women he's gotten to, you know, Oscar statues as well. I oh, mean, for legitimately good roles. 
Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Even in like lesser of his films, they will win. Well, okay. So Diane Keaton, right? For for um, Annie Hall, she got an Oscar for it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Diane Weist twice for Bullets mm-hmm. Over Broadway and Hannah and Her Sisters. Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Blue Jasmine chick. What's her name? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the Australian uh, one. Uh, yeah, her, her name's uh, slipping my mind. But you, you guys know who I'm. We're talking. Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett. You, and you and you miss and you and you bypassed one on Mighty Aphrodite. Right. Um, what's her name? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mia Sorvino won for that too. Yeah, and Mia, poor thing, Mia Sorvino. She wouldn't break out the knee pads for Harvey Weinstein. That's why her career got torpedoed. Everybody knows that. She she wouldn't give him a blowjob. He wanted her to give him a blowjob after she won the Oscar, and she wouldn't. That's why she got lousy roles and got sidelined in Hollywood. Isn't that fucking tragic? Because that's yeah, the truth. it's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why fucking Gwyneth Paltrow got an Oscar because she could. The, the rumor, the scuttlebutt, is that she could make him come twice in a single session. Is that fucking low or what? Anyway, uh, with that little Hollywood uh, tidbit, let me continue on. The point I'm trying to make here is that see. Woody Allen knows how to write women. You, you got the Rachel McAdams character. You got Vicky and Christina, who are two women radically different, and yet they're friends, and it makes sense. The way he wrote them, the, 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 the way he directed them, the actresses, it made sense that they'd be friends and that they'd be different and that they would wind up with very different lives. You know, uh, Then you had the Rachel McAdams character, who is sort of like a, 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 she's a minor character, She's the, the, the wife of the screenwriter who's played by um, Owen Wilson or mm-hmm. the other Wilson. I forget which of which were the, the blonde one, right? And <laughs> it's Owen, yeah. Yeah, and, and, she, um, and, and, and she's written in a way that you, you, it makes sense that she'd be hot for the Michael Sheen character, okay? Who's also a minor, minor character. Uh, and then, you know, Jasmine in Blue Jasmine, the, the Kate Blanchett um, character, She's just, she's having a nervous breakdown. She's falling apart. That's what's going on here. Uh, the, the only thing I thought about that movie it was mis, miscasting of Peter Sarsgaard as the boyfriend. He was mm. too young for her, or he looked too young. It should have been somebody else, somebody older looking. Somebody like, not quite Frank Langella. Well, I, Frank Langella passed away, I believe. But um, No, you're shitting me. I did not know that. Sorry, I, 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 I really hope that's not true. I, I, I thought that he did. Let me confirm. Or deny. Yeah, he did. he's still alive. Oh, God. okay. I'm sorry. Sorry, Frank. You know, if you're listening, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man, you gave us a scare. <laughs> sorry, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I read his That's book, okay. by the way. It was, it was very funny. It, oh yeah, and, uh, it dropped names. It, yeah, I, it's, it's, yeah, it was an amusing. Odd book. recommendation for a podcast, but yeah, that's a really good book. Yeah, it, it's fun. You know, and, and he talks. He basically, it's the stories he's been dining out on. You can tell. And they're funny stories. And, and they're, they're, he's talking about people he knows. And he, he's sort of like being a little bit indiscreet. But there's something about him that you're like, ah, it's fine. You know? But anyway, um, yeah, she, she should have been dating somebody older in that picture. I think it was miscasting there and didn't quite work. But uh, what I, what I want to say is that, see, he knows how to write women. He knows how to direct them. And they're not the same woman. They are constantly involving. Han and her sisters, he's got like four very different women. I mean, I know that it's sort of like based on the Brothers Karamazov, right? Uh, but they're very, very different women, and they behave, and, and it's just... Actually, no, there were only three sisters in that one, right? There's three sisters, but there's also the mother uh, of them, and there's also the uh, Carrie Fisher role, who, even though side characters are as rich uh, a consideration as a character as, as the three main sisters. Yeah, so, so he knows how to write women, and he writes exceptionally uh, interesting women. Uh, you know, for good or ill, some of them are awful people. Some of them are a little bit tragic and silly, you know, but they are real it's really hard to do what he's doing with women, okay? And it's obviously a guy who's taken, who's kept a really good eye on women, who's, who's watched them, okay? I'm not talking about, like, mentally disrobing them. I'm talking about psychologically disrobing them, of, like, taking right. them apart and figuring them out in, in a way that I can't think of any other uh, film director who comes close to him of knowing women, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I, it's a, the thing is here, here's the thing. I never believed that Woody Allen's character could wind up taking Julia Roberts to bed in that movie. What was the movie that she was in? Um, oh, God. I, 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 I know which, I've forgotten which one it was. Yeah, I, I forget which one. But the thing is, I think it was Everybody Says I Love You. Yeah, I think it's Everybody Says I Love You, perhaps. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, 
I, I wouldn't believe that the Woody Allen character could pull it off. But Woody <laughs> Allen, yes. I, I firmly believe that because he's got that ruthlessness, that, that knowing, like, I press these buttons and I can get her to bed, okay? Because his, his, his persona does not have that ability, but he does. It, because he's watched them, he's observed them, he's, he's, like, kept an eye on them. And so that's why his characters, his female characters, are so rich. And that's why the, the actresses who play them keep, get, keep getting Oscars, okay? Blue Jasmine came out five years ago. Okay, which in the scope of a career like his, a 50-year career, you know, it's like yesterday, basically. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what's going to happen now after this thing, because he's in post-production on Rainy Day in New York, which is his last picture, the one where the, half the actors decided to, like, disown basic, him. Or disown something. him, yeah. I wonder what's going to happen. Also, well, I wonder what's going to happen to the actors who have disowned him. I don't think that long-term they are going to find favor in Hollywood. I think that this is a passing fad, and and I think that it's it's going to be a little bit like like you know the the um, the, the people in in every moral panic like this that the ones who capitulate are going to be sort of like ostracized later, you know what I mean? So here's something uh, that would be interesting to me is I I think he could do it, but I don't know that the you know the situation would allow for it. I would love to see Woody Allen do a film on a Me Too woman. Oh no, you know that's not I mean? no, but it, it wouldn't be interesting. Okay. Why wouldn't it be interesting? Well, because he would not approach it like that because he's never been a political filmmaker. No, 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 no. it's not about politics, but the kind of woman who gets herself into a sort of um, you know, accusatory position. Mhm. Mm you know, it doesn't have to be like, oh, you know, I here's the proxy for Harvey Weinstein, let me tell you about the relationship between the you know, the sexes in terms of, you know, sloganeering. But the idea of like, you know, like um like Philip Roth did in uh, I Married a Communist or The Human Stain, mm -hmm. right? Where he is examining the type of mentality or the character who would make make use of accusations against a, uh, another man or not another man, uh, uh, a man. It's, it's a woman making the accusations. That I think he could do. And I think he could do very interestingly. It's a, he, He's not good at that. Or let me phrase it. He doesn't want to do political films. Like, think about As I said, I don't think I don't think it's I don't. I, my interpretation is that you know once you do it right, you, you the poli the politics goes away very quickly because it becomes a human motivation story. Because at the end of the day, it, it, it's not a, an exercise in saying, you know, almost like what is, what is a you know a, what are the liberal woman versus the conservative woman say? It's like no, it's it's more about you know like what kind of situation is the woman in where she finds the need you know to make an accusation whether she believed it or not, and to kind of you know make the calls from there and what happens to a person who makes that and those around her you know that to me you know you can remove the whole question of politics at a certain point from that and it's still kind of effective mm -hmm. i don't feel it doesn't sound like you're there's there's convinced attitudes at the other end of this conversation no no it's I, i'm i'm chewing it over uh i'm not sure i have to chew it over some more um I expect the audience to be chewing this over immediately and putting <laughs> fierce comments in the yeah, in the video about screaming, about, you know, screaming at us podcasters. You know, you're right or you're wrong or wake up. You know, accept <coughs> actually reality what, I, or, what I want a I want a ten page detailed outline of what this Woody Allen movie would be in the comments. Chop chop. <laughs> What's interesting is that he he's, he's twice uh, that I recall he's twice been uh, an actor for hire. Uh, once in the seventies and once in the nineties. I mean, I know that in the 60s he did more work for hire as an actor. But in the 70s, I can't recall any other picture except The Front, which, by the way, The Front aged badly. Um, and and yeah. Scenes from a Mall also aged badly. It, scenes from a Mall, it actually makes a lot of sense. He is, I think he's a talent agent married to Bette Midler, and they go to the mall. <laughs> and it's basically that. I think it was directed by Paul Mazursky. And um, it was in late 80s or 1990, somewhere around then. And uh, it's, it's very, um, I found it funny at the time that I watched it, uh, but it's a very 80s comedy. The, 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 the set, everything about it is very 80s, you know? Uh, right. The front is also, it looks very 60s, 70s kind of look to it because there's also something else. 
because he's used such extraordinary cinematographers over the years, uh, Woody Allen's pictures seem very timeless. They, they seem a little bit divorced from what's going on around them, especially after Annie Hall, because though I have not seen his early comedies, the early funny ones, uh, I've seen clips of them and pieces of them, and they look of their time, whereas after Annie Hall, they, they seem divorced from time. Right. They, they seem a little That's bit right. outside of time, you know? Um, I always say that the, the A.N. Wilson quip about um, the Queen, you know, not quip, but observation, you know, a very true observation. He said that the Queen is never in style, and yet that's, why precise, that's precisely why when you see old pictures of her, it's the Queen, whereas everybody else seems like, oh, it's these people wearing out-of-fashion clothes. Because at the time, they were very fashionable, but now they seem ridiculous, whereas the Queen, since she's never in style, she is ignoring fashion trends. She always Precisely. looks like the queen, you know. Same, same which with, will, which will, which will no longer be the case, by the way, because even the marriage is now a fashionable mm. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's for another podcast. But anyway, exactly. the, the, the thing about um, Woody Allen as an actor, I, I want to—he was—he um, had such a strong persona that he was never able to break out of it. And I always think of Hugh Grant in that movie, Extreme Measures, that he did with, um, with what's his face, with Gene Hackman. Uh, it was a really good performance. It was a trivial movie, you know, not very interesting script. But his performance, Hugh Grant's performance, was really good. Hugh Grant, before the rom-coms of Four Weddings and a Funeral, he was a very good actor. If you see him, he did a previous picture with Roman Polanski right before uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral. He did it with Kristen Scott Thomas, who was his co-star in Four Weddings and a Funeral. They played a married couple uh, that is on a boat with uh, Peter Coyote, who's a wheelchair guy, married to Emmanuel Signor, who was the um, who is the wife of Roman Polanski, <laughs> another person involved in a sex scandal, although a very different one, an actual sex scandal, as opposed right. to a fictitious one in this case, and. Um, the the uh, it was like a psycho psycho uh, psychodrama psychosexual drama melodrama it was kind of ridiculous but anyway bitter moon yeah, yeah. bitter moon exactly and the thing about the um, uh, 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 what's his face uh, Hugh Grant is that he was never able to break out of that Hugh Grant persona the 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 lovable you know floppy haired Brit right and he's been playing that role ever since I think that he wants to kill himself by this time I, I remember mean, I like know that he wants to. What? Around that time, remember, he kind of, what kind of kept him in amber was that he had a little bit of a scandal, too. Remember when he got yeah, caught he in the blowjob? Yeah, from some yeah. prostitute, Divine prostitute, Brown? Yeah. Divine Brown, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, how, how times have uh, not changed. But anyway, the, the thing of, the, of Woody Allen, yeah, that you don't see him being like any other guy except that guy, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a shame because I think that he would have played interesting other roles, but I don't think that the the public would ever see him in any other role. Well, I, I it's funny because we had talked about Stanley Kubrick. I'm sure you heard this. the The original choice for the Ziegler character, played by Sidney Pollack, he wanted Woody Allen in that role, and Woody Allen said, "You are fucking nuts to even think about me in that role." Yeah, yeah. Well, he knows himself. He knows what he. And that's brought. and that's part of the thing. I I. I I'm about 95% sure that the reason the Woody Allen persona persists that he never escaped it is because he conscientiously chose not to. Mm. So I don't think it was just an imposition and Woody Allen's like, I have range. I don't think Woody Allen is the kind of guy who would said he have range in acting. You know what I mean? I think he knows what part he can play and he plays it. And it, and I think the fact that he was a stand up comedian as well, which you are performing, you have a persona. Mm -hmm. And that front, you know, it's hard to escape that. Like, for example, it's no surprise that, you know, the Seinfeld show, Jerry Seinfeld is just playing Jerry Seinfeld. Right. And he's never not been Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Same thing with all of the stand-up comedians who get a, you know, their, um, their, their, their time in the spotlight, their show. Even if they do ingenious, crazy things, like I did think Seinfeld was ingenious, but not nearly as ingenious as Gary Shandling and the Larry Sanders show. Yeah. It's still Gary Shandling at the yeah. end of the day. His persona, his humor and whatnot. I think what he's is just the same kind of manifestation of that. Well, what's interesting is that he's given the opportunity for other actors to really expand their range. Think of um, Andrew Dice Clay in uh, Blue Jasmine. It was really an mm. extraordinary performance. It was like, whoa. Which came out of nowhere. It's like, when did you show up? Man? Yeah. Who the fuck is this guy? Oh, it's the Dice Man? Fuck you. It can't be. 
You know, it's his long lost twin brother. It can't be him. Yeah, and it was, it was really good, a great performance. Uh, I mean, a minor performance in the scheme of things, but he nailed it. He did the job and did it really well because there was not a moment that I thought that he wasn't who he claimed to be. I right. never thought to myself, oh, it's the dice man, you know, winking at us. No, no, no. And, and, and he was like this schlubby Italian guy or, or whatever. Yeah, he was Italian, right? It, it was, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's just who he was. Or, or I don't think, I think Andrew Dice Clay is actually Jewish, but it doesn't matter. He, he was playing the role perfectly. He fit, you know, he was like this New York, New Jersey guy and, and not a very successful one. And, and sort of like, you know, things going south for him, you know, and, and it worked. You know, uh, uh, and he's done that with a lot of actors. I mean, giving them, well, like, like for instance, uh, uh, what's it, in Mia Sorvino, um, Mira Sorvino in, in um, Mighty, Mighty Aphrodite. Aphrodite. Mira Sorvino is a really, really sharp girl. Uh, she went to some Ivy League school. She's no dummy, okay? And, uh, being, and she plays a bimbo. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is, playing a bimbo is one of the hardest things for an actress to do. It's not mm -hmm. as easy as it looks, on the contrary, especially for really smart ones. Uh, it's like bad acting, you know, Julianne Moore said that the hardest part of doing Boogie Nights was to do the, the porn scenes, not because there was any pornography, they didn't do any pornography, but because it was the bad acting was so hard. Precisely. <laughs> because you're, well, the, the, yeah. the other time when you see that manifested is like whenever in a movie or in a TV show, they have to have like someone play like a shitty like high school band. Yeah. They can never get it right because anybody recording the music it just cannot bring themselves to be that bad. Yeah, it's basically that with acting. Yeah, and and what? <laughs> yeah, it, it's really really hard to to do that, you know. Because yeah. So anyway, um, he gives them the opportunity to have enormous range, but he consciously decides not to have that range, and that's why, for instance, you were saying, well, wouldn't it be great if he ever did a Me Too movie? Precisely for that reason, he'd never do it, you know. Uh, like Irrational Man, for instance, who, which was one of the, the later pictures. Um, well, it was a great performance by Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix is, is a really extraordinary actor. I mean, I, th I think that he's, people aren't giving him enough credit for what a great a actor he is. You know, and I, I liked him ever since I, f I first saw him in uh, Gladiator. And even then I thought, wow, that's a really good performance in a basically just a big, production movie but then to see him like uh, uh have you ever seen um the uh uh the paul thomas anderson movie he was in uh um, oh yeah the pension oh. picture yeah the, the... Uh, well the pension picture but before that he was in uh, uh oh, the master. master i haven't yeah. seen the Ma master oh you gotta go see it i know it's i know it. i have to but it, there, there's something about it. it's that look paul thomas anderson is just a try hard that's the thing that bothers me about him and i'm a little bit sick of it you know he's just trying too goddamn hard to be like the next kubrick Okay, he wants so hard for this uh, artistic glorification, and I, I, I kind of like react to that, because that that's another thing about Woody Allen that I really appreciate. He was never pretentious. He, he's not striving for the big accolades. He gets them, but he's not. That's not his aim. He doesn't even show up to get the awards either. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But the thing is, he he is genuinely trying to make pictures that he enjoys making and that are genuinely funny or genuinely uh i mean he cares about making good work he doesn't care about people's opinion of him yes okay precisely. and that's a different mentality i mean uh paul thomas anderson great director sure okay let me phrase that technically he's a great director i i am thinking less and less of him as the years go on i saw phantom thread you see it yet i have it on my shelf i haven't watched it yet um uh, you're yeah, not going to recommend it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to recommend it at all. You know, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's 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 very well crafted. He, he was his own cinematographer and he did a very good job. It's beautifully shot, beautifully lit, uh, great performances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just trying too fucking hard. It, he, it's just boring. It's annoying. Okay. Because he's not aiming to, to deliver. He's, he's using the work not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end. Mm. And, and in, a means to his own aggrandizement as an individual. That's very different. I hear what I, I hear. I can see that. I can hear yeah. what you're saying there. And that, that's and that's and that's because that's I think fundamentally why you know the whole question it, you know they're always going to come up. Uh, who's who's going to last? You know, a hundred years from now, who's still going to be watched? I don't think there's ever been a moment in my life 
where I thought, yeah, these Woody Allen movies, they're they're not going to stand the test. Oh, no, of time. I think, no, it, yeah, no. They're, 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 the staying power has been proven. Oh yeah, right. I think he could come out of, go out of fashion for a period of time. Oh yeah, precisely for the reasons we've been talking about. Long term, no damage, no damage. This no, is the no. this is the goods. These are the real goods. Yeah, because, I mean, you look at a picture like Manhattan, and, like, sure, they're driving 70s cars and 70s clothes and all the rest of it, and it feels 70s, right? It doesn't feel like a period piece. It feels like, you know, but um, but it works. And here's, here's what's interesting. You know, you compare uh, Manhattan to Stardust Memories, which is actually kind of like Manhattan Redo, and uh, it doesn't quite work. It, it feels of right. its time. It doesn't quite deliver. It, it doesn't transcend itself, transcends its period and transcend the, 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 the point in time in which it was made, whereas Manhattan does. So there are certain pieces of work that he has done that do transcend. Annie Hall, Manhattan, uh, uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors, uh, Hannah and Her Sisters. I think uh, Radio Days and, I mean, the, like the second tier work, because that that we just mentioned, that was a top tier work. Annie Hall, Manhattan, Crimes and Misdemeanors, um, Hannah and Her Sisters, which other one would be topped here? Uh, I think the ones you, you listed are probably would be the. I, I wouldn't really. I don't know that I'd add any more. Yeah, like second tier that are like n not minor Woody Allen pictures, but you know second tier would be for me. It would be like um, Radio Days, Another Woman. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Hus I would have husband, to, I, I, uh, husband, Rose of Cairo. Husbands and Wives. Yep. Uh, Bullets Over Broadway. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'd say that. And, 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 and the ones we were kind of talking about yeah. Match Point, Midnight in Paris, that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 That's uh, Vicky Christina that, Barcelona. There's a, good, there's, a good, there's a good deep crop of solid films. Yeah. And the second if, tier. Yeah. Say. And the real bottom of the barrel, you know, if you want to get like that, it would be To Roam with Love, Celebrity. And um, anything else? I'd say Melinda, Melinda, Melinda for me. I, I that goes to the bottom. No, it said it was it was a failure, but it was not a disaster. Celebrity and and to Rome with love, that was fucking disasters. That was just fucking embarrassing. Okay, I remember watching uh, to Rome with love in a, a theater in Germany, and I was like embarrassed. I was like, what the fuck <laughs> is this shit? You know, it was just like really bad Woody Allen, just bad, bad. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was embarrassed by it. And uh, celebrity, yeah, I remember seeing that uh, with um, Woody, uh, with uh, what's his name, uh, Kenneth Branagh pretending to be Woody Allen. Because it's also funny. There's like a whole subgenre of performances of actors who are hired by Woody Allen to pretend to be Woody Allen, which is fucking weird. <laughs> Kenneth Branagh. Well, Brano, that's a good question. Who do, who do you think did the? Who do you think gave the best Woody Allen performance? Who wasn't Woody Allen? <laughs> it's an no, exercise no, no, you could take. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I I couldn't qualify that. But like Owen Wilson, Kenneth Branagh, uh, Will Ferrell. Who else? Yep. Who else played the the? I would argue that uh, Michael Caine in Hannah and Her Sisters played the Woody Allen yes, character. He did. He yeah. did. Funny enough, because Woody Allen is in the movie, too. Yeah, that, that's kind of weird. Um, yeah, but which, which other... Um... No, I think those are the big ones. Those are the ones that uh, that come to mind. Because every, every, the other people I would think of who are in Woody Allen movies are not playing Woody Allen parts. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking at the list. Deconstructing Harry is basically uh, Woody Allen pretending to be Philip Roth. And yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. Uh, because what's interesting to me, I think, is that as an artist, at some point, he wanted to be a writer. I mean, let me rephrase it. He has written. He's written a lot. And he's been published by New Yorker. He, he's, a, he, he, you know. But I think that at some point, he must have wanted to be a serious writer, like a novelist. And I yes. think that retros retrospectively, he must think to himself, no, I made the right choice. And, and I think that Deconstructing Harry, in a weird way, is kind of like a kiss-off to uh, fiction writers, you know? I, I, I don't know. It's, I'm pure no, no, speculation, I, I, but you whether, know what I'm whether they're, whether they're a kiss-off to fiction writers, I think that was his decision that I, I, me, Woody Allen, made the right choice. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, whether other people are great authors, God bless them, go and do their thing, but so, I made what's good for me. Yeah, exactly right. I, I think that that's the, the vibe. Okay, so yeah, so I think this is a good concluding point to end on, which is basically this. I think you're hearing 
from us consistently. You know, this is a guy who brought the goods to the table. Yeah. This is genuine love you got from yeah. both of the people here. Yeah. And are there some sour spots? Yeah. This is some interesting personal life shit that, you know, you know, potentially gets in the way. Not yet. Yes and no. Not really. You know, um, at the end of the day, there's, you know, you are going to get from this guy uh, richness, not just in characters, but also in like just how a film really should get made even without the eccentricities and excesses that, you know, you may ordinarily look for. It's like, you know, this is like honest to God, like base level critical craftsmanship you got here. So my, my attitude was always like, yeah, Hey, you've probably seen a few of those films. Go, you know, go watch more. There's no reason not to. And this is the other thing about Woody Allen, which is always great. He's never really, I can't recall made a film over like two hours, maybe yeah. once or twice. <laughs> No, 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 I don't think he's made a picture over two hours. But no, I think that the lesson to be drawn about, from Woody Allen rather, is that he was cl very clear as to what he wanted to achieve because he wanted to be a film director who wrote his own scripts and who could hire whomever he wanted. It was a very clear goal. And at a relatively young age, at 40, he accomplished that goal with uh, Woody Allen. That was basically his point of departure, where, whereby he could do whatever picture he wanted and he would get the cast, he would get the financing, he would do his picture and nobody else's. And that goal that he set himself, he achieved it, and from there he just continued to create a body of work that is eminently respectable. Uh, I don't care what your name is or, or who you are, nobody can look down on his body of work because it is, it is something real. And there are great directors who envy him, envy the career that he built for himself, okay? And it's because uh, uh, Francis Coppola famously because he was just consistent. Every year he would do his script and shoot his movie and cut his movie and release it and he'd go on to the next one. He never, he never lingered over his pictures. He never like went on and on about like, oh, you know, I did this great picture and so forth and so on. No, 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 he just kept on going. And that, that kind of attitude of like a shark never stopping, right? Because, you know, the idea being that the shark, if it stops, it dies. I think that that's something really applicable in life in general. And I think that, he he's just somebody admirable somebody that i can really take seriously you know what i mean agree you know it, yeah what woody allen is not is a dead shark <laughs> no 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 and like i said i think that he's going to be around a lot longer i mean i think that yeah he's in his 80s 82 uh, at this time i believe i think that he's going to be around a lot longer and i'm really looking forward to seeing his pictures because even the shitty ones are kind of good even the, the ones that are not top tier, they're interesting. And when he manages to crack out, you know, a, a relatively high-end picture, like he has in the not-too-distant past, it's sort of like, wow, you know, the old guy still got it. You know, you, you got to appreciate that and admire that. And I certainly do. And so I guess with that, we'll sign off. So, Dr. Benway, why don't you take us out? Well... If let me put it this way, if this is a club which loves Woody Allen movies, I'm actually happy to be a member. Yeah, yeah, so am I. And so with that, uh, all the best, and we will catch you next time. Take it easy.